If I just shoot it like boring old television, it'll be dynamic. I could put these fuckers in a white shirt up against a white wall, and I got a movie. Because these guys are so great. If you unlike my video in a dream, you better wake up and apologize, because this week it's Reservoir Dogs. Written and directed by Quentin Tarantino, starring Harvey Keitel, Michael Madison, Tim Roth, and Steve Buscemi. A group of career criminals who have never met, using aliases, deal with the consequences of a heist gone wrong. Tarantino told us a lot about how his entire career would go from the very first scene in his debut film. Because you have a bunch of characters sitting around in a scene that doesn't move the plot along at all. He devotes, what, 10, 15 minutes of precious screen time to inconsequential conversations about the inertia and nuances of tipping and just things that don't really matter. Tarantino casts himself in one of the roles as he delivers a pop culture monologue about the secret hidden meaning in a Madonna song. And none of it moves the plot along. And this perfectly sums up Tarantino's style in so many ways. But not just his style, but his persona. His persona is so important to his career and his films in general. He clearly stands out as the worst actor in the scene, which isn't even a slight against him. I mean, you've got Harvey Keitel, Michael Madison, Steve Buscemi, so many incredible actors. The sheer confidence and self-belief he has to cast himself in the opening of his film with quite a lot of dialogue and probably the first real vintage Tarantino monologue that became his trademark. That kind of self-belief basically defines his whole career and how it's panned out because Tarantino's real superpower is himself. He is a salesman. I defy you to watch any footage of him talking about movies, making movies, watching movies, whether it's him in a video store or the set of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood with some of the biggest name actors in the industry working on cut rate prices just because they want to work with him. His enthusiasm levels are basically the same. He is like a Labrador running around. And the same way when you see a dog running around chewing its toy, even if you're knackered or you've fucking had a shit day at work, you can't help but be infected by it. I love fucking with an audience. I mean, I love taking them on a, taking them on a ride. And it's not, they're not just watching a movie where images are glazing over them. I'm fucking with them. I'm, I'm, giving them, I'm giving them experience. They may appreciate the experience. They may not appreciate the experience. That is what his superpower is, where you hear the story of how this film got made, and it sounds implausible until you see Tarantino and what he's like. You can picture him at film festivals as a guy that never made a film before, pitching his movie to Hollywood's best actors. Any normal person should be shitting it in that situation, but you honestly would believe he would not only not be shitting it, he would thrive in that kind of scenario. He met Steve Buscemi at a film festival. He was the first of the actors that eventually became in the film that believed in his talent and believed in the story and wanted to do something with him. The part Steve Buscemi wanted was the part that Tarantino had earmarked for himself. Whereas most people would be doing backflips thinking, shit, I've actually got a real actor, a name actor, a face who wants to be in my film. He'll be brilliant. Absolutely, you can have it, you can have the part, you can rewrite the script, you can do whatever the fuck you want. Tarantino turned around and said, well, that's for me, but I'll guess I'll let you audition for it. And he auditioned for it, for this guy who'd never even made a film, maybe had made a short film at this point, and he got the part. But that just sums him up. He is fucking nuts. And it's all in the first scene in his debut film. I need you cool. Are you cool? I'm cool. Well, you don't look cool to me. I'm why don't cool. you walk in? Why don't you spot some water in your face and really cool that? Most people develop and learn over a career and become something, but he really did just seem to arrive fully formed as the filmmaker he continues to be. Number one, every single Tarantino film I've ever watched, I always pick up on the dialogue because it's so cool and stylized. The monologues, the back and forwards with the character. When I watch the opening scene, I always think of Steve Buscemi's character because we don't really know these people. It's just open to them all eating breakfast, you know. They're a bunch of likely lads. And Steve Steve Buscemi goes on about, no, I don't tip. Harvey Cattell's character is really against it. It's like, what do you mean you don't fucking tip? These people make nothing. This is where they make their money from. And he raises a very good point about, in America, the service culture, because being English, of course, when I went to America and I didn't tip, by accident, by the way, I genuinely just forgot. The woman got really rude and I was like, oh, but that's where they make most of their money. But his point is, but we don't tip dentists for doing their job. And I always think, has he got a point? 
fine or is he just being obnoxious? What's your take on well, that? Well, that, that again is why it's such brilliant dialogue because Tim Roth on the set of Pulp Fiction described it as like he's the modern Charles Dickens. And I've not read a lot of Dickens, but his reason for saying that was he wrote about the every guy. You know, he wrote about normal people living kind of normal lives and having normal interactions. And that's what it's like because I have those conversations. I was in America last year and I had those conversations. My, my view on it is this basically. I don't know what yours is. I tip like they tip in the States when I'm in the States because I'm not a dick like Steve Buscemi you know I disagree with it I do it in protest if I was writing a check I'd write a little in protest on the thing where you're allowed to write a little comment on checks right. but I do it just because if I went to the Middle East I wouldn't cry about my missus having to cover her hair or whatever do you know what I mean right. it's, it's right. you're in there you've gone there do what they do but it's complete bullshit especially in dining situations because it's this thing where they get way below minimum wage can only survive on tips like Harvey Cartel's character points out mm. but basically when you break it down the service industry these business owners have put the responsibility of paying their staff's salary onto you like go fuck yourself Good tip point. is supposed to be tip it's not supposed to be wages anyway what's your point I think on it well I, I just was going to frame different examples like because so for example I've just been to the barbers and I always tip him a fiver because mm. I think you tip a fiver yeah wow, I, I feel cheap I think he's a I think he's a good lad we have good conversation have a laugh we have a chat mm. he's, he's a good lad so I give him a fiver when I've been to restaurants where you know sometimes the service charge ain't included mm. I won't hit like this is gonna sound I, I sound a bit like Steve Buscemi's character but I'm not trying to be like I don't hit unless I really felt an attachment to them if they come over and are like all miserable I won't feel inclined to mm. so I mean I, I'm leaning towards Steve Buscemi now I think he's right with the gold standard like <laughs> they need to give the gold standard of service well, do, yeah do you know what it's weird Thanks as well because much. discussing it in an American context is different to a rest mm. of the world or a UK context because American tipping is just so ingrained to everything and it's just like you do it everything is 20% everything's 20% more expensive like you have to do the calculations in your head it's like doing VAT. Like, how annoyed are you when you're buying something and then they put the VAT on at the end? Possibly. And you're like, well, that's not the fucking price then, is it, dickhead? Yeah. But it's like you said, I also don't like it. When everyone gets a tip, no one gets a tip. I want a tip when someone's good. Because ultimately, it's basically your way of saying, hey, good job, I liked you or you did a good job today. And you're thanking someone in the only way you actually care about when you're working, for the most part, which is monetarily. You know, a pat on yeah. the back doesn't really mean anything from your boss. Like, how about some more fucking money? But, again, look how long we've gone off to talking about tipping because mm. that's the beauty of it that's what Tarantino is so good at capturing it's not just monologues like he's known for his monologues obviously but it's conversations and topics that is it there's no like melodrama attached to the scenes when they talk they talk like real people they talk about the shit that we talk about all right and then like the most outrageous stuff is the stuff that rings the most true and as much as, like I said, it was inconsequential essentially to the plot, there's actually a lot of hidden information in this opening scene about every character. You know, Steve Buscemi is a bit of a weasel. You don't disagree with his logic, but you disagree with his resolution. Harvey Cattell's like, yeah, the system's unfair, but I'm not going to take it out on these fucking single mums and shit that are trying to earn some money. Steve Buscemi's like, nah, I'm going to do it. But the moment the big boss says, like, fucking pay the tip, he backs down. So we learn, okay, he's a lot of talk, but not really when it comes comes down to it against these bigger guys he's not the alpha in the room Harvey Keitel even as good as an actor as he is couldn't play a pussy <laughs> he's just he just emanates gangster like mm. he just feels like yeah. a fucking tough guy but we see this caring side of him he's going off on this diatribe about you know single mothers this is the only job that they can have when they're unskilled and blah 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 you see there's this caring side of him that's going to come out when he becomes like a fucking mother hen looking after Mr. Orange for the majority of the film who's a tough guy Come on, who's a tough guy? I'm a tough guy. Who's a tough guy? Michael Madison jokingly says, hey, do you want me to kill this guy? To the big boss, referring to Mr. White, Harvey Keitel's character. And he does the little double guns as a joke. And Harvey Keitel comes back with that great line about if you shoot me in a dream, you better wake up and apologize. But it also says something about his character and foreshadows what he's like. It's the fact that he has absolute loyalty to this big boss man because we see later once he gets out of prison and he doesn't rat, he's well looked after. And more than just the business side, it's like a father figure.
guess, type thing. His relationship with Nice Guy Eddie feels more like a brother. It's hinting at his loyalty to him, but it's also hinting at his view to violence. You know, Steve Buscemi says, hey, you know, I don't want to kill anyone, but if it's me or them, I'll have to do it. Harvey Keitel sees it as a business thing. He doesn't want to kill anyone, but he will. Although, like they say later, any real people? No, just cops. So hmm. no one seems to mind shooting cops in this film. But Michael Madison is a sociopath. And in that famous scene we see later with the ear, you know, hints at here the way he views violence and killing people he, with a RG shucks sort of smile on his face. So you get all this hidden information about the different characters and what they're like. Mr. Orange. Maybe I'm just superimposing this because I know now he's an undercover cop, but something about him doesn't quite fit in in the scene. You know, he says, I'm not tipping either. And the boss mm. just kind of dismisses him. I shut up. And he's like, okay. So you're saying that the 15 minute that didn't contribute to the film in hindsight when you've seen the film contributes a lot it contributes a lot tells you <laughs> everything you need to know about the characters and how things are going to play out and basically tells you everything about Quentin Tarantino and how his career is going to play out and why he had such a great career beyond just his talents as a writer and filmmaker I remember watching this film and I remember finishing that opening scene and going wow that was a cool intro and then it moves on to them going outside sparking the cigarette walking down in slow motion with a boom 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 boom, boom, boom. And I remember seeing it like what is this film this is incredible and unlocking a core memory here because it, it came to me when I was watching it again you remember when I told everyone to come to school in their suits oh yeah and I, I recreated the scene for school in media studies and basically in our media studies we did BTEC media because we were the scumbags who could yeah. do proper it, courses it's basically special education yeah. media so the last two years <laughs> of our school was just media studies yeah. just filming we had a teacher who was a complete donut a great guy actually had a great career he'd worked as like an assistant editor on Phantom Man menace and stuff you know he, he had a good career and then somehow ended up teaching i don't know how maybe he just wanted to teach maybe he had like a michelle pfeiffer and dangerous mind sort of course of life i don't know he was also in star wars but it's just the back of someone's head and you never see his face oh you mean he's an extra for a second yeah yeah so no one believes yeah he would that. always pause <laughs> yeah. there's to be a split second in the phantom menace where he was like, like supposedly look. one of the dudes running with a ray gun yeah and he'd pause it and it'd be this horrible blurry image in the background <laughs> of someone that didn't even look like it him. Clearly weren't him. We would do amazing work, but we fucked off his lesson plan. We would just do what we want. In one of the rooms, we obviously had a bunch of TVs mm -hmm. and they would be playing DVDs or I think it even sort of had a video play at the time. Yeah, it did. And we would just have certain films would just always be running or always on and you might do some work, you might walk in and be like, oh, someone's playing Reservoir yeah. Dogs again and you'd sit down and start watching it. Yeah, it was so cool, man. Blade Runner was always on Reservoir Dogs, but I don't know. I just like the scene. I like the style. As I think Declan, we had got the FX7 Sony camera which had the slow motion feature mm. so I was like shit what perfect way to test out the slow motion then recreate the Reservoir Dogs and we had our teacher Mr. Martin like all in suits just walking down smoking I'm pretty cigarettes. sure you fell over at the end oh I yeah. fell over at the end yeah I'd love to get it back but it, it just brings like my point is like the nostalgia films can bring like I haven't remembered that in years but when I saw that scene I was like fuck this is so great are you gonna bark all day little doggy? Or are you going to bite? What was that? There's something about Tarantino. It makes me think of three people for some reason are coming to mind. Two will make sense. One's probably a bit of a curveball. Yeah. Firstly, Leone. Leone, in a lot of ways, totally makes sense. It's the most obvious. You know, Tarantino always talks about how Leone's a massive influence. You know, you see definitely visual cues and touches of Leone. There's a lot of huge wide shots cutting immediately to an extreme close up of someone's hands or someone's mm -hmm. face. Mr. Dramatic reintroduction when they're in the warehouse later in the film and he just suddenly seems to appear out of nowhere no one hears him walk in and he's just leaning against a pillar smoking a cigarette very cowboy-esque how he's introduced yeah. so you see those sort of cues but it's more the fact of how I feel when I'm watching a Leone film there's no pretense there's no symbolism what you see is what you get unapologetic pure popcorn entertainment but done to a level of quality that's just mesmerising mm. I'm not laughing, but I'm smiling. It's the same with Bill Hicks. Bill Hicks gets some criticism for not being that funny, not necessarily always even trying to be that funny. You know, a lot of critics used to call it laughter. It's not laughter he's getting, it's sort of clapping and nodding of like, I agree, oh, that's so beautifully put the way I, mm. I think that thing you just said. And it's kind of like, I remember Kubrick talking about, he got a Lifetime Achievement Award and you know, he's terrified of flying and never left at that time. So he didn't go out to see it, but he recorded a video 
Leo, accepting it. And one of the things he said, which is so perfect and sums up Kubrick as well, of how he's misunderstood as this pretentious filmmaker, but he really wasn't. He said, you can get awards, you can get this, you can get like people intellectually masturbating and doing mental backflips to justify why something's good or something's interesting. But you yourself, in a feeling you can't convey or articulate, you know when you get something right, mm. that feeling of like, oh, that right, that's, that's just innately good. Everyone will like that moment, even if they don't like the whole film. And you have that same feeling when you recognise it. It's just fucking excellent. Delving a bit deeper. Remember that Shane Meadows lecture? He was saying about making his first film, weren't he? And he was going onto the set. Bob Hoskins was there. And he, he had no idea what he was doing. And he put that down to... He didn't go film school. Did Tarantino have a background in like film school? What was his skill set? So he, he had a film school. It wasn't going to film school. It was watching shitloads of films. Right. Being an obsessed film dork working in a video shop, watching endless films, and he just understood how to make films. Why are you here today in this particular video store? Well, because I used to work at this video store for five years. I was behind the counter charging people late fees, <laughs> recommending movies and stuff, and now as everything's kind of come full circle because uh, my movies come out on video and this is the opening day and so I'm here to send it off. He started making contacts with people in the industry through writing. All you need is a typewriter or a computer to write. You know, you don't need a camera, you don't need this, you don't need lights, you don't need actors. So that's the easiest inlet. And his talents as a writer was there really early on. I think he'd written quite a few scripts, but he had two scripts that were actually being shopped around. Right. One that he really wanted to keep and make, which was Reservoir Dogs. The other that he was open to selling, which was Natural Born Killers. Oh, wow. Oh, sorry, he also had True Romance knocking around at this time, which I believe he wanted to make, but he was eventually went to Tony Scott. Natural Born Killers eventually went to Oliver Stone and quite a few changes were made but selling these films got his name established in the industry even in the lower circles got him connections with people people started seeing his scripts and reading his scripts the first person to kind of come across him like I said before was Steve Buscemi Steve Buscemi really believed in him and that's the interesting thing as well you've got to think the wealth of acting talent is so much stronger than the wealth of directing talent and writing talent now maybe that's the talent that ends up actually doing well because naturally actors have more star power and even on lower levels they have more recognizability and you know that maybe they're an easier commodity to get sold and trade and and invested in in the industry so naturally it's easier for talent to even on the lower levels do well writers we know get fucked over even yeah. with the writing strikes that have been successfully got them a few more rights and and things writers get fucked over and directing's hard because you know you know actors they have three bombs in a row it doesn't really matter because they'll turn up in something else and their careers restarted whereas directors it's harder to get your first break you know it's kind of like being an actor's a footballer if you have a bad game fuck it you're one of loads in a cast you know you're one of loads in a team you know it doesn't matter if you maybe have a bad day or a bad game or whatever you're carried through whereas being a director is like a boxer one bad fight going wrong could end your career yeah. or derail your career forever you. and just getting into you know getting that first film where people are handing you money to find out if you're good. An actor, you can see an audition. You can't really audition as a filmmaker. You can make a short mm. film like you did with Steve Buscemi, but you can't really do it. So it's hard. So maybe that's why. But sorry, the reason I started that rant was actors, the best actors, even actors that aren't earning loads of money, they're desperate to work with good directors. Mm. Desperate to work with good material. they so supportive for the most part of them. And Steve Buscemi clearly was like, this guy's talented. I want this part. I want this film. I want to at least know him. I want to help but even if I don't be in the film, I want to help him be able to make a film. This guy's great. Online, there's video examples of test films and short films and things that they film together to try and get funding for the film or raise awareness for it for the, for the eventual full film that they would make. You can see the early style of Tarantino in the short film. You know, it's it's very scruffy. The sound's bad. The camera's placed in weird spots at times. But you know that kind of way, especially early Tarantino that I think he lost, where the camera wouldn't move, but it'd be placed nearly far mm. away from the action. You know, there'd be someone over there running about doing something, arguing, and the camera's quite far away. But what they're looking for might be behind where the camera's positioned. And eventually the action comes back to the camera and, you know, the depth of field change and they come into focus 
focus and suddenly we're in a big close-up yeah. from that wide shot and obviously you know once he got to once upon a time in hollywood he was on a huge budget and you can say yeah we'll just use a big crane with a gyro head on top and move it around and explore and you can be very fluid that way but there was something beautiful about the simplicity of his early filming and you could see it in these short films he made with steve buscemi but when it got shown around oh. film festival circuits it was laughed at by established cinematographers who said it was this amateurish weird dumb camera placement that didn't make any sense but it's because they were conventional and they couldn't see what he was trying to do yeah and i like you know some of his later films i always pick up after reservoir dogs that the shots in other films he'd have a lot of characters speaking but it'd be behind their heads and stuff like that i just thought it was fucking cool as hell you know i'll pick a director out jonathan glazer at least with him before he made feature films he had a background in like famous for doing adverts like guinness there's a music the videos. horses music videos for the white stripes and obviously they're not as big as on a scale as films but it's still a big operation so you just need to upsize whereas he's just gone from a sort of handmade short film background i just find it quite staggering I mean, like, for a debut film, it's pretty polished. Mm. <laughs> but it just staggers my mind, like, literally. It's well, incredible, he, really. Well, he obviously, he must have built up, like, an encyclopedic understanding of film language. Like, you know, when you watch enough films, you can tell what's going on in the film or what the director's trying to convey by these little cues that they give yeah, you. Yeah. And it's, it's that. Like, when you understand that enough, you can outlay it. Like, you might need to hire a guy that actually understands different lenses and mm-hmm. what, how to achieve what you're describing, but you understand stand it innately if i don't have a single solitary idea of how to shoot a given scene which is shit you think about when you've never made a movie before if i just shoot it like boring old television it'll be dynamic because these guys are so great i could put these fuckers in a white shirt up against a white wall and i got a movie Hitchcock, like I always say, described films as life of the boring bits cut out. Whereas Tarantino and what come to define kind of 90s anti-filmmaking was we've seen enough of the interesting bits and the boring bits actually aren't that boring. Let's look at that. And that is what this is because, you know, it's a heist movie without a heist. We never see the heist. The closest bits of action are the fallout directly around the heist. But they're only shown just to give little snippets of context that we couldn't have got otherwise. You know, how Mr. Orange ended up getting shot shot that's all secondary that's just the reason to get to what he's actually interested is these characters and these moments between them and everything else it's kind of insane because it kind of like morphs genres it builds up the heist them going to meet the big boss then you don't see the heist then it becomes a game of cluedo of like who done it do you know what i mean look i know i'm no piece of shit i'm pretty sure you're okay i'm fucking positive you're on the level So let's try and figure out who the bad guy is, all right? Do you know the setting of that empty warehouse? It reminds me of the way it's done of the theater. Big empty spaces and they're all going around from room to room, from set to set. Dialogue while the camera is sort of like there, stationary. Going back to when he's shot in the car, Tim Roth, there's a meme that I always see on like Mondays where it's like Monday mood. And he's like there in the yeah. back with like holding like, I'm dying. Like, You're going to be okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Say the fucking yeah. words. Say the fucking words. <laughs> and like, I wonder, I wonder, because like Tim Roth's been in a number of his films, hasn't mm. he? It's quite strange. I wonder how he came across him because he's like an English actor just plumped in the middle. Of so it. I think he came on later because Tarantino was ready to go with a tiny 30 grand budget. He was going to play Mr pink i think steve buscemi was maybe gonna play mr white oh really and then harvey keitel got a copy of the script from a friend because it was kind of being passed around hollywood you know couldn't email it around in those days it was literally physical copies getting passed about and he read it it was i think it was the week before tarantino was going to start filming with the 30 grand budget and he left him came home to a voicemail from harvey keitel saying i've read the script i love it i want to play this character i want to get this film made i reckon i can speak to people and get maybe a million and a half raised for to make the film i can connect you with other actors Actors that I know would read this and want to be involved with this. You know, the rest is history. Lawrence Bender was going, studied at this one, was going to this one acting class. And his teacher was married to an actress named Lily Parker, who is a, was a member of the actor studio in New York who knew Harvey. Lawrence got it to his acting teacher in Los Angeles. His teacher read it and liked it, then sent it to New York to his wife, Lily Parker, 
who I don't know, Lawrence doesn't know, he knew her husband. Lily Parker read it and liked it and gave it to Harvey Cattell. So we're really liking Lily. Three days later, Harvey Cattell called up Lawrence Bender. And we got on the phone with him and he goes, yes, well, Quentin, I would love to do this movie. I think it's fantastic. And uh, uh, the script is it's, it's, it's quite amazing. Uh, and the dialogue and oh, just wonderful writer. So, uh, uh, but I, I want to be involved in it. I would like to be one of the producers. I want to help you get in. You're the boss, but you know, I want to think I can, we can maybe help you get it made. You know, at that time, Harvey Cattell saying he's going to be the star of your movie. It's not like all of a sudden doors flew open or anything like that, but he gave us legitimacy. We had no legitimacy. We were just a couple of guys out there trying to get a movie made like millions of other guys in Hollywood. Be okay. Oh, God. Say the goddamn fucking words. Say it. Oh, okay, Larry. Number one, like, with that wound and that amount of blood that was being lost, I'm very surprised that he survived the whole film. But when I first watched it, obviously, I realised the highest is went wrong. They're all starting to blame each other. So automatically, though, you're like, who's done this? The overarching suspect to me, the little rat weasel Steve Buscemi, because I was thinking, he reminds me of Randall from Recess. He could <laughs> be like a little rat grass. I'm pretty sure figuring out who is responsible or what really happened happened never occurred to me oh really i always try and work out <laughs> well it would in a normal film where it's more of a conventional like who done it or a mystery but what i was engaged with or what i was thinking about was the characters and the way they're interacting and mm. the way the camera's placed and just the in the moment storytelling the in the moment filmmaking i guess is what had me in and where it was going i don't know if that really interested me enough to I see. think about it like i don't think i was even thinking like like, wow, I wonder what really happened with the heist. I do remember being absolutely shocked the first time I was watching it, finding out that Mr. Orange is the undercover cop. They're saying Tarantino is going to do one more film. The film critic, mm. he always said he was going to do a certain number or retire by a certain age. So when he retires, what would you do if he turned around and said, look, I have an extended version of Reservoir Dogs to reveal to you now I've retired where we actually see the heist. Would you be interested in that or would it not contribute anything? I would be interested because it's more Tarantino stuff. Yeah. And when you have a director this good, it's like, you know how people bitch like, ah, oh, Scorsese's films are getting too long and I'm like mate how much longer do you reckon he's going to be yeah, alive true. to make films give me every last yeah. drop give me the b-roll of someone opening a door <laughs> yeah, if Scorsese yeah. filmed it like I want it all so I would take it all but in terms of the reason you're asking the question of finding out more about it I don't know because you'd have to men in black wipe my memory and show me the movie for the yeah. first time with the high scene intact to truly know if it takes away or provides more but I don't know I definitely would want to watch it what about you yeah, I would, but I think then again, as a film fan and just life in general at the moment, I think everyone always wants more, more, more. Sometimes when you get the more, you're thinking, oh, I wish I didn't do that. Do you know what I oh, mean? Yeah, absolutely. So, like, but I want to talk about Mr. Orange's backstory. I like mm. the way that we get shown he's an undercover cop, we get shown him being given the case. He'd never done being an undercover cop before, so he's been trained up by a more experienced undercover cover cop and they he's giving him all these scenarios and I fucking love the scene where they tell him if they question you tell them this story about how you was delivering weed because there was a shortage and then you went in the bathroom to do a piss and there was like a big police dog there and then you see him deliver it later to like get in their good books excellent film and as well when you think about short performances that just nail it the cop in the bathroom telling the fake story is the perfect cop telling a story delivery like when he's like mm. hey buddy if you don't move i'm gonna shoot you in the fucking face <laughs> and then they're all like they're all like fucking for some reason eating a donut within the toilet yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're just like looking around it's just it's just brilliant and i said buddy I'm going to shoot you in the face. We get a little bit of their backstories. Like you touched on earlier about Michael Madison, you know, but we find out that he went to prison for quite a long stretch and he didn't rat them out. Mm. And I love that scene in the big boss's office where he comes back from prison and then nice guy Eddie's there. And they, in a strange homoerotic kind of way, they start wrestling each other on the floor and he's like, for fuck's sake, guys. Like, like they're talking about him getting fucked by a black guy in prison yeah. and then they leads him to wrestling on the floor but it felt very 
brotherly, like mischievous brothers. Like, you know, you have that one cousin that you actually really like. If he comes to a, a fucking shitty family event, you yeah, can chat yeah, to him yeah, on yeah. the side and be like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. It, it felt like that, even though they obviously weren't related. And it felt like nearly a fatherly son relationship mm. between him and the boss. Played by Lawrence Tierney, who seemingly was fucking nuts on the set. Like, he was pulling guns really? on people. He was threatening people. I think he actually had a lot more scenes he was supposed to be in and they ended up cutting it down because he was just so volatile on set getting into arguments with people he was just off his trolley was he on coke or something? I don't know like I guess <laughs> he might have some sort of substance abuse shit going on sounded like it I can't remember exactly but he apparently was just a nightmare on set he wasn't showing up a lot of the time and was just generally cantankerous let's go to work so talking about iconic scenes, the famous scene where Michael Madison shows back up, he has the little confrontation with Mr. White. Miss Orange is dying in the corner there arguing. The camera kind of zooms out just to the milkshake and you can see him slurping it. And then he coolly turns around and goes, are you going to bark all day, little doggy? Or are you going to bite? And I was like, wow, what a fucking oh, that's entrance. that's brilliant. But it all gets squashed the moment they realise he's got a cop in the booth. And yeah. they seem so excited to beat the shit out of this cop. And it doesn't even seem to be about really getting info out of him. They just want to beat the fuck out of him. Mr. White and Mr. Pink need to go move the cars or do something mm. that leaves Mr. Blonde alone with the cop. And this is where we get to the brilliant iconic scene with Stuck in the Middle with you playing as he tortures him and cuts his ear off. Although you don't see him cut the ear off, remember being very squeamish. He plays the psychopathic element so well when he's like, oh, I listen to the greatest hits and he's dancing around, slashing him up. And then he gets the ear and goes, hello, hello, can you hear me? And he's playing the radio station that we hear throughout the film with the legendary Stephen Wright with his dry delivery doing the radio voice that comes in and out. It nearly feels like it's inspired by the Warriors uh, mm. radio voice woman where she's kind of narrating it, but he has no narration, nothing to contribute to the plot. It's again, just for the sake of, it's cool. And if you're going to have a radio DJ coming in every now and then, why not make it Stephen Wright with the fucking coolest, driest delivery ever? And he's playing that music. He's torturing him. i got to be honest, I never found this scene even squirmish. And I never found Reservoir Dogs particularly violent. Yeah, but, I don't know. Something about chopping the ear off. Just... Uh, no, no, don't get me wrong. It's yeah. violent. But the way this film was talked about and Tarantino for years in the early parts of his career was talked about with critics and the media described him as he's a violent guy he's the violent director he loves violence in his films and we're probably just jaded or I'm probably just jaded now but I was watching I was like yes yeah, violent it's a cool scene the actual cutting the ear off didn't bother me for whatever reason but the look of him like the makeup is brilliant like he looks like the most beaten up guy ever <laughs> like mm. one eye is completely fucked he looks like he swam to set because he's drenched in yeah. so much sweat and blood and bruises makeup's really good especially for a low budget film and it's because the guy who made the makeup I can't remember his name who did the makeup talented guy established guy but agreed to do it for free on the basis that Tarantino would write a full screenplay out of the story idea he had and that story idea would become From Dust Till Dawn oh shit so again you're seeing Tarantino in these days he could knock out a script for someone else of that quality a legendary film doing it as a favour slash payment in exchange for not having to pay him to do the makeup yeah about the radio stations it seems to be like a recurring theme in a lot of his films it's like heavily involved in jackie brown it's a lot in pulp fiction as well it just reminds me of gta like the radio stations mm. are the best part of it going around and yeah you know well, like... he does a great job of creating the sense of a universe and a mm. world you know his own cigarette brand Big Kahuna Burger, a the burger, burger joint, you know, yeah, the mm, tasty burger. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, he 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 creates these fake brands and fake radio stations, and he really does create like a a living, breathing universe, and everything is in line with the tone of the world he sets. And mm. his films in these days were grounded, but makes it feel more grounded and believable because all these outside elements that we have in everyday life, maybe it's a bit more stylized, not quite like like what is in the real world, but because they're all on par with each other, everything. It fits together perfectly. Cops in the boot, he's cut his ear off, he's drenched him in petrol, and he's about to set him alight, and all of a sudden, the stricken Mr. Orange 
bang, 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 shoots him dead. And I was a bit shocked by that, actually. Mm, number, so was I. Number one, I thought Mr. Orange hadn't moved for a long time. So I thought, he's actually dead now, probably. <laughs> so, like, he shoots him. And then, like, you're thinking, fuck, like, when the others come back, how is this going to be explained? So the film takes on another element because he's not just going to fall down mm. with blood all over him. Do you know what I mean? But the cop is a really good actor as well. The cop mm. has been beaten up. You know, he's like, I'm Marvin Nash. Yeah. yeah. He, I believe that he had the shit kicked out of him that much and he's been tortured and he's scared. As much as I loved him rough, I felt like his performance at times got a little bit too over the top. Yeah, or, yeah. Or the delivery of it wasn't quite right. It didn't sit right with me. But obviously he has less screen time. But the actor really sold it for me that he's that fucked up and he's, you know, he's like, well, how do I look? Like I'm deformed. I'm fucking this. Yeah, a lot of the lines of when he starts talking about his family, that was kind of ad lib. He was talking about his real family and he made a point of not telling Michael Madison that he was going to do that, but telling him a lot about his family and his little boy and describing him beforehand right, right. so that when he hit him with it in the scene, it fucked with Michael Madison and it made it more believable, but he said it actually didn't help his performance at all because he's supposed to not be bothered. But yeah, he, I get but, you. But he himself, his character's not supposed to be bothered, but, but he himself was being really bothered by it. Boy, his, his character would take great pleasure in mm. being like, you're never going to see your little boy again. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So now we get to the, the nuts and bolts of it. Like, they found out that someone's betrayed him. We know that Mr. Orange is the rap. You're just really now waiting to see how it's going to come to a head because Nice Guy Eddie in his brilliant track shell suit, by the way, has gone off because he's very incapable. He's actually a buffoon. An idiot. Tricky. Yeah, like let, let's face it. So like, as soon as he as soon as he goes in and he sees the cars park, you, you talked about the person in charge here straight away. He's like, we need to move these cars because my dad ain't gonna be happy. Like everything rolls around. Yeah, him. you know, like I think he even calls him daddy. Yeah, yeah. At yeah point. Well, to be fair, it's a bit like me and my dad. Never <laughs> <laughs> heard you call him dad. I don't. I don't know who's got to lose. I don't know if anybody's got to lose. I don't know who's dead. I don't know who's alive. I don't know who's caught. I don't know who's not. Nice guy Eddie sees essentially we've seen the relationship built up between them. They're like brothers, as you said. You know, it'll be like me walking in here, you're just mysteriously on the floor with blood all around you. I'll be like, what the fuck's going on here? Then the dad comes back and he seemingly knows who the rat is. And Harvey Cattell's character has been caring for the poor Mr. Stricken Orange because he feels responsible because they were in the car together. What happens is we get a fantastic Mexican standoff. <laughs> They're all like round each other with guns pointed at each other and they're saying like don't shoot him and nice guy Eddie rightfully so because I wouldn't like it he's like don't fucking point a gun at my dad and you're like shit of course it ends in a Mexican standoff yeah. but it doesn't feel contrived it doesn't feel unfamiliar it all feels fresh like this film at the time must have felt like Larry stop pointing that fucking gun at my dad <laughs> At this point, it's that suspense thing where you, the audience, know something, but the rest of the characters don't, or some of the characters don't know everything. Mm. Mr. White, by far the most likable character in the whole film. Deep down, I bet, logically, he wouldn't be going against his boss. He wouldn't be going against Nice Guy Eddie in defending Mr. Orange still. He's justifying why would he have killed Mr. Blonde. To be fair, Mr. Blonde, as we find out, revealed his psychopathic nature to everyone during the heist when he just started killing all the hostages mm -hmm. unnecessarily, massacring people for no reason, which is a big part of the reason he's against him. But it's not just that. It's also the fact that you've seen in flashback scenes him really really bonding with Mr. Orange. He's taking him under his wing. Mm. We've seen in the opening scene where his perspective of whether you should tip or not is informed by how he emphasizes with the single mothers that could only get a job as being a waitress. So we know from his character, he is gonna risk his life and defy these people that he's known for years and worked with for years to protect his life. Yeah. But it's informed by his feelings. But we know he's wrong. Mr. Orange mm. has lied to him. He is the rat. And as all the guns start going off, everyone's killed. Mr. White is seemingly mortally wounded but not dead yet crawls over to Mr. Orange he decides to confess in their dying moments as you can hear the police showing up outside Steve Buscemi's character true to form has decided to steal the money and try and escape out the back you can actually hear faintly him getting caught by the police oh, as really? the camera zooms in to Harvey Keitel and Mr. Orange's face in a real close up shot in the dying moments as the police burst in we see the gun being put to Mr. Orange 
Orange's head and once he disappears from frame the sound of the gun going off and then a load of guns and then a load of guns going off cuts to black and for no apparent reason we get put the lime in the coconut suspect put the lime in the coconut (laughs) so basically we got the conclusion to the film it really is the highest gone wrong like literally every single person is dead that was Mm. (laughs) ever involved in the highest I remember that night you know Harry lived with, like I said, with fuck out in Malibu and PCH. So yeah. it from Malibu to Glendale. I remember taking Sunset the long way around. And I was a little drunk, all right, because we were drinking, I'm not like smashed, but just drinking wine, you know. So. And um, I wanted that long drive because I was the, maybe the happiest I'd ever been in my life. I had just had dinner with my actors from my movie, and I just knew it was just going to be great. And I just took this long, long drive and just thought about how great life was. I want to close on a question. Mm -hmm. With the film critic seemingly being Tarantino's last film, you know what he's like. Mm -hmm. He's likely to be like, I'm back and then come back later. If it is, would you consider Tarantino as one of the greatest directors of all time? If he just started making um, scary movie sequels for the next 50 years, I'd still consider him one of the greatest directors of all time. Wow, fantastic. Like, he's no- <laughs> nothing he could do to tarnish it. Yeah, way. yeah. Uh, it's I just... mean, if he'd stopped after Jackie Brown or Pulp Fiction, I'd probably still consider him one wow. of the greatest directors of all time. High praise, man. I hope if it is his last film ever, because I'll put it out there on record, I'm not a big fan of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I just, uh, it was a well-made film, but I didn't feel any connection to the mm. characters. But I I really do hope if the film critic is his last, I hope it's a good swan song. Overall, I know we end it in, would you recommend this film? It's a given. Fucking easy. Like, we don't even have to say that. My thoughts on it is, the more I think about it, it's just an outstanding achievement for a debut film. I can't emphasise that enough. Knowing now what Tarantino went on to do, now in hindsight, you can see it, as you said, and it's so good as a film fan to see it. Great performance performances cool as fuck great dialogue great music fantastic film i don't think many of you won't have seen it but if any of you haven't seen it fucking watch this film is all i can say it's incredible like you said it's a given that we're recommending it won't even bother with that bit but do you know it's, it's a film that kind of set the tone for the 90s and the 90s is one of my absolute favorite decades of filmmaking culturally the 90s was so interesting the mainstream when non-mainstream for a decade and conventional anti-storytelling they were getting the opportunity to make films like this even on a big level music became really interesting again like even the poppy stuff was different and strange and interesting and Tarantino has by and large remained the same you know the budgets have got bigger on this film everyone had to bring their own clothes because he couldn't afford it the cars were provided by the actors they just brought their own cars because he couldn't afford it the chase sequence they literally had to wait for the lights to go green because they couldn't actually close down a road they was filming on a normal wow. road as, as, as everyone else was driving about you know the budgets have gone much bigger but the essence of how he makes films is the same but the industry has changed a lot and you know it's, it hasn't been the 90s for a very long time both in calendar wise and also filmmaking wise you know and although it's a it's, it is a very interesting period for filmmaking like there's a lot of very interesting small budget films coming out but I wish sometimes filmmaking could go back to the 90s a bit. You know, put the camera somewhere strange. Don't do things for the sake of the plot. Do things just because it's interesting or it's cool or it's beautiful or it's intriguing in the moment. A line of dialogue about something that doesn't matter, but it's just interesting or it's left in just because it's a great line. They say, kill your darlings in screenwriting school or, you know, don't keep in things just because you like them. Cake them out. Well, fuck that. Mm. Take out the stuff that moves the plot forward so that you can fit in more of the shit that is just great. Like, what's the point of all this? You know, it's not a formula we're trying to create. It's not truly a science. It's art. I want to see interesting, bizarre, weird films with odd ways of doing it and trying things. And even if it doesn't work, fuck it, you tried. Which I guess is me saying that it is an easy recommendation from the Film 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 Show. Mr. Blonde, Mr. Blue, Mr. Orange, Mr. Pink. Why am I Mr. Pink? Because you're a faggot, all right? (laughs) 